Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to present on the diagnosis of active TB, which I've given the subtitle Modern Tools for a Post-Pandemic Response. My name is Morten Ruwald. I'm the director of TB at FIND, the Global Alliance for Diagnostics. So this is the first uh, of three TB presentations uh, at this conference. So I'll give a little bit of context um, on, on TB. So if we ignore COVID-19 for a second, uh, TB remains the largest infectious disease killer. The disease develops slowly, it's difficult to diagnose and it's hard to treat. Most cases are found among the, the urban poor and these are probably where we have some of the largest diagnostic uh, gaps. And COVID-19 really has impacted TB services and also the health seeking behavior across the world. But there is a global push for post-pandemic recovery, but we need new tools and new processes uh, to make this happen. And I'll try to cover this as part of my presentation today. Just in numbers, we have 10 million people who get TB every year. A million of these are people living with HIV. Half a million have drug-resistant TB. We have 1.4 million deaths. We have 4.2 million who remain undiagnosed every year. So that's almost half of all TB patients. Globally, only about one in three TB patients are bacteriologically confirmed. Only 20% <clears throat> are diagnosed with a WHO recommended molecular diagnostic test. And only one in three of those who have drug resistant uh, TB are tested and put on relevant treatment. So as you can see, there's huge diagnostic gaps. COVID only made things worse. And the first 12 months of COVID-19 seems to have eliminated 12 years of progress in the fight against TB. We've lost 1.3 million people uh, who are uh, not notified in 2020 compared to 2019. <clears throat> and we have seen the biggest impacts in the um, high TB incidence uh, countries, uh, in, uh, India, Indonesia, Philippines, China, Bangladesh, but it's a global phenomenon. As you can see here, the, uh, the impact on mortality is anticipated to be uh, long lasting. The incidence is increasing and it will also be a long lasting effect. Diagnosis remains the, t uh, the weakest link in the cascade of care and we really urgently need to have better tools. The reason why this is uh, not uh, perfect is that um, the tools we, are, uh, we have are not fit for purpose. People initiate uh, care where uh, there is no capacity to diagnose TB, so we need tools that can go to that level of the healthcare. Um, and we do a lot of symptom-based screening, uh, which really probably misses half of TB cases in the community. And there's a big reliance on sputum, which also makes the diagnosis difficult, and we do perhaps select patients who have the most advanced disease. But COVID also has come with a lot of new opportunities. We've seen a game changer in, in the way, you know, diagnoses have been brought closer to the patients. Many people are very comfortable now with self-testing. We've seen a, a massive investment in the diagnostic portfolio. A lot of new molecular platforms are coming out. And it's really up to the TB community now to leverage the investments, both in the infrastructure, the digital the connectivity, and also the new tools to see if we can build back better in a, in a new, um, and a, perhaps a new reality with, uh, with new tools. Um, and this is not only for active TB, there's also a lot of stuff happening for TB infection and test and treat strategies. Um, so I'll talk about that uh, over the next uh, 25 minutes. The first class of technologies I'll talk about is chest X-rays and computer-aided diagnostic software. So um, chest X-rays remains the most sensitive tool we have to, uh, to detect long TB. We have digital X-rays that now can be fed into artificial intelligence software uh, and within a minute or so come with, uh, with a diagnosis or an abnormality score at least. We have 
at least 15 products that are either commercially available or close to becoming commercially available. A lot of version upgrades, a lot of new features being added all the time, and it's really a new area for policymakers and regulators. Together with Stop TB, Find have tried to uh, to bring a little bit of, uh, of of order in this field uh, through the AI for Health uh, webpage, where you can then look at the different softwares head to head and make the procurement uh, decisions there. Not all softwares are created equal. And this is a very nice study from uh, from Vietnam that has looked at more than a thousand. Uh, participants, uh, whereof uh, more than 100 had uh, confirmed TB. You can see in these uh, rock curves here that, uh, that some seems to be very good, where others are uh, not working at all. And some of those that are performing better are even performing better than the expert uh, radiologists with more than 30 years of experience. And then we have the intermediate uh, training readers here with about five years experience, and many of these softwares are outperforming uh, them as well. So clearly we need much more uh, evidence like this to, uh, to drive sort of the comparisons. This becomes very powerful when you combine it with portable X-ray systems. Um, and the smallest ones like this one uh, from Aspen Imaging in the US, you have a super sensitive screen and a very small and portable X-ray um, generator. You then put it on a tripod like this, and then you, you take your images. Uh, they are low power, so you don't need to have a lead apron as long as you are a couple of meters away from the, uh, the instrument. This is uh, another instrument where they've implemented it in a really rural mining um, community in, in, in Pakistan. And you can see this battery operated tool really does deliver, you know, the sky is sitting with the software here next to the to the X-ray, and they have sort of a unit of a couple of, of people that can screen perhaps up to two, 300 people a day. These are with solar powered, um, so you can really take it into the communities where there's no electricity or in the really rural settings, you can carry them in backpacks or put them in trucks, etc. Find have written a, uh, or generated a report where you can um, read about the various different types of software, but also on the, the hardware, and you can find it at the Find web page. Showing you here um, a small movie about how a screening is done. He's being questioned, and they fill out the questionnaire, then the chest X-ray is done simply like that. And then the image goes in here and gets interpreted on the other uh, X-ray, and with a five-minute workflow, uh, you have screened uh, an individual that can either go for further confirmatory testing or being that go back into the society. So there are several other technologies, point of care ultrasound, digital enabled stethoscopes where you, um, or AI enabled stethoscopes, or even AI enabled cough apps where you cough into your smartphone. All of these approaches are being uh, developed. <clears throat> and you could see, you know, if you had a screen tool, that basically is just a recording of a cough. That would be a complete different way of looking at TB. The next uh, class of technologies I'll talk about is, is lamb tests that really bring diagnostics closer to where the patients um, are. And this is of high relevance for, for HIV. So LAM is a molecule that's found in the outer membrane of the, uh, the mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis. It's found in the granuloma or where the site of infection deep in the lung, and it then gets secreted uh, into the bloodstream and gets secreted into urine where it can be, um, be picked up. So we have the Allelam and we have the Fujilam as the established tests uh, at the moment. Um, and the, uh, the Fujilam uh, seems to be at least or about twice the, the sensitivity at a comparable specificity as the, as the Allelam. And the unique thing about this class of diagnostic is that the, the poorer the, the, uh, the immune status of the patient, the better this test seems to work. So in participants with a really low CD4 cell count, those with advanced HIV disease, the sensitivity is almost 90% here with the Fujilam, and it is retained to about 45%, 43% here around uh, with a high CD4 cell count. The Allelam, 
has about 56% sensitivity in that population, and it drops down to about 11% <clears throat> with a high CD4 cell count. So it's a lot of anticipation around the, uh, the Fujilam test being able to deliver um, where, you know, a better diagnosis for, for this underserved patient population group. In the HIV uninfected, <clears throat> and that's where we hope this class of technologies can go eventually, is uh, we're seeing a sensitivity of around 50%, um, where the allele M has only about 10% uh, sensitivity. So clearly, you know, this is not good enough, but we, we have good proof of concept that we can make this better. And we're working on three different uh, approaches, better reagents and pre-analytics, better sample preparation, also pre-analytic, and then for the analysis itself, better assay design. So we're working together with many other partners in developing uh, new uh, reagents, um, new antibodies, et cetera. We're working on ways to, to concentrate uh, the lab molecule in the, uh, the sample. And we are also working on new innovative assay designs with many different manufacturers using readers uh, or various ways of amplifying the, uh, the signal. This is just one example of, of how the future might look for, uh, for land-based assays. This is the, um, the project from SD Biosensor uh, that recently was kicked off. So they aim to develop a, um, a reader-based uh, tool here with a, um, a fluorescent dye. Uh, and then they have a suite of different uh, readers that you can then put the, uh, the, the, the test into. Some of these are battery operated uh, and they all offer connectivity and we anticipate these to be ready for trialing um, sometime in 2023. Um, I've been asked to talk mostly about active TB diagnostics and uh, molecular tools. Uh, and this is where we, we are at the moment. We have, uh, you know, for, for, for sputum based tools, we have microscopy, we have line probe assays for drug resistance detection. We have lamp assays for really simple TB detection culture systems and then for the molecular we have the uh, the mobile TrueNet system or the gene expert uh, system but it's clear that um, as i mentioned in the introduction only one in three patients are bacteriologically confirmed and only one in five patients are diagnosed with molecular tests so what we're offering at the moment is not good enough. And there was a recent uh, systematic review commissioned by WHO that basically uh, concluded it was uncertain whether there had been a reduction in mortality uh, with the implementation of the expert MTB RIF compared to uh, sputum smear microscopy. Um, and the reasons are many and, and demonstrated in many, many different studies. And it's basically a poor fit for, for the healthcare system. So we need something that's simpler. So we need new sample types. We need new simpler assays like point of care molecular assays, or we need really better sample transport systems for high central uh, centralized high throughput molecular tools. And I'll start talking first about new sample types. There's been a lot of work on, on swab-based diagnostics through COVID, and uh, these are also, when you scrape the back of the tongue, we are starting to see uh, good evidence suggesting that this could be a viable approach for non sputum based diagnostic for TB. And this is just one of the new swab types that have been developed with funding from the Gates Foundation together with Quantigen and Steripack. They've developed a dry swab here, you self-swab, or with, uh, with help from a healthcare provider, and then you put the dry swap into this, um, this uh, media-free uh, transport, this, this cartridge you could say, you sort of plug it in there, and then you can send it to the, uh, the lab, where they can automatically uh, decap here and, uh, and add different buffers, et cetera. Um, and then you can either, you are centralized or point of care testing this kind of tool. I'll talk about it in a minute again. We've also seen a lot of work on, on aerosol-based uh, capture. Either way, you blow into a tube where there's a small filter that kind of captures the bacteria, or on face masks where you have uh, absorptive strips where the, uh, the bacteria or the viruses kind of gets captured on these strips, 
And you can then take the strips out and use a um, molecular assay like the DNA expert system to, to detect TB there. Uh, this project is even more uh, futuristic. So this is a wearable instrument-free CRISPR-based tool that uh, has been developed for COVID-19. So you wear the mask and inside the mask there's this sample collection zone here where the, uh, the viruses are then captured. And you then press this blister on the side here, it washes through this uh, sample collection zone, gets into a lysis zone where um, the, uh, the viruses in this case are being uh, made available for the genetic material in the viruses is being made available for, for analysis. And then they have an isothermal amplification and the Sherlock detection zone, and it goes out on a lateral flow here that is in the side of this uh, device. Even more futuristic, you see this uh, this um, chip-based uh, approach uh, where the uh, assay is also captured here. Um, but these are prototypes in, in development. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, we now have WHO policy on stool as a sample for, for pediatrics. So another non-sputum-based uh, sampling method that really is um, uh, needs to be now taken up in, in country uh, after uh, demonstrating um, uh, good evidence for its use. And you can look here at the, um, one of the methods, the, uh, the SOS method developed by the KNCB group in, in, um, in the Netherlands. Uh, they have a full uh, standard operating uh, procedure and, and with demo videos uh, to support how to, to use these. Then we have new molecular tests. Um, currently, WHO approved our Cephate system and the Volbio. We recently saw the 10 color uh, instrument and the XDR cartridge from, from Cephate, but we also have from, from Volbio the true uh, new INH fluoroquinolone and bedaquiline chips, and also TB, TB and COVID chip in development. There are two new large platforms designed basically to go into the space where Cephate is dominant at the moment. The Standard M10 from SD Biosensor and the RNQ from, from Bioneer. Standard M10 comes with uh, up to eight random access modules, a nice assay panel. They can use either isothermal or qPCR. They can take up to 12 targets. Um, and the TB assay, which will, uh, which is uh, C marked here in Q4 2021, has uh, RIF and INH inside the cartridge and gives a result within 60 minutes. The Bioneer has up to 48 targets, uh, so it offers basically TB, RIF, INH, fluoroquinolone, and second line injectable uh, detection in the cartridge uh, and. I hope they will be working on a uh, perhaps a, a more modern uh, panel where, where perhaps the, the second line injectables is substituted with a more relevant uh, drug. This instrument here offers results in, in less than an hour and, um, and really um, seems to be a, a very powerful tool with a nice uh, assay menu as well. But where we probably need to go is point of care molecular. And many of you are probably aware of the, um, the um, EXPEL trial that was published recently in New England. Um, and here they demonstrate that if you place the diagnostic next to the patient, you can get a 56% uh, increase in treatment starts measured at day 40 compared to standard of care. They demonstrated this with the Cephate Edge system. Uh, we had anticipated the Cephate Omni to be launched, but this has been cancelled from Cephate's side. So there's not going to be an Omni platform for TB. But we also have more bio uh, that could go into this uh, use case as well. But there is a lot of fast followers, and I'll talk more about the Lumira technology in a second, but SD Biosensor could probably also be pushed really lower into the, into the healthcare uh, system. But through the investments uh, from COVID, we're seeing a lot of really simpler platforms coming through. Um, and I'll talk also about those in a second. So the first one here is the uh, Lumira DX. Um, it's a platform that is anticipated to be uh, put into clinical trial in about a year's time. 
They go straight for a swap as the, as the sample. You have a simple lysis step, it takes about five minutes, and then you put it on the uh, strip here and put it inside this smart little machine that can both do immunoassay and, uh, and uh, molecular detection. And within 15 minutes, they claim to have the amplification done and a total time to result is about 20 minutes in a non-sputum-based uh, tool. But COVID has led to a lot of other uh, platforms that are coming through. I'm just giving you two examples here. So this is the Lucero COVID test. It's launched about a year ago. It's a single-use, over-the-counter molecular COVID-19 self-test. Uh, so you basically, uh, you do your COVID swap, put it in this instrument, it does the PCR, and then you throw it away afterwards. We also seen CRISPR-based technologies really being accelerated through the COVID pandemic. Uh, so this is from uh, Tata in, in India. So it's made in India device uh, that really is super simple for COVID detection. And we would anticipate stuff like this coming in for, for TB as well. But there's a lot of other platforms that are uh, happening and some of these already have uh, TB projects. So I think we should anticipate much more diversified um, um, yeah, environment for diagnostics in the future, which is fantastic. So now I'll talk about the uh, centralized high throughput approaches. Uh, so we have now uh, four WHO recommended um, centralized assays and a couple of others that are not recommended yet. But all of these platforms offer high throughput testing, upfront NIH, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, isoniazide testing, and they can be used for multiple diseases like HIV, hepatitis, et cetera. The performance is similar to expert, and the resistance detection is for isoniazid and RIF is similar to line probe assays, and they have all been policy recommended. So you can imagine a future where you have community healthcare workers that do swabbing of a large number of patients. You have a proper um, sample referral system, and then you have these centralized approaches. So you can run up to 384 specimens in an eight-hour shift. And if you then have a proper connectivity tool that allows the diagnosis to go back to the patient or the healthcare workers in the community, you really have something that's different um, from, from where you are now, where the patient has to go to, uh, into a, uh, the level two to get the sample done. But with, uh, with new tools like uh, this one I talked about earlier, this uh, self-swapping device developed for COVID, uh, and new tools, you can really go into a much more industrial scale here. So this is a workflow that's been developed by the, uh, the Gates Foundation with Quantigen, Stereopack, Cortiva, and LGC under the, um, for COVID. Uh, <clears throat> they now have a fully automated workflow, and I'll just walk you through how that looks. So they do um, an automated sampling, uh, swap handling and sampling preparation. Then they run it on the, the next cell, high throughput PCR system, and it can do up to 100,000 samples per, per day, um, this instrument. So, you know, this is really, really high throughput. They use an assay tape with 6,000 samples per run. And then this tape, you can see the reel here being, being assembled, um, is then undergoing PCR uh, or thermal cycling, and then uh, you do a reading afterwards. Because there is a barcode on this uh, fancy device here, you really ensure that the, the sample can be uh, tracked back or it's barcoded throughout the analysis and the handling. Uh, you can really um, make sure that few or no errors are done and the um, result get back to the relevant patient in a fully automated way. <clears throat> also want to mention that <clears throat> 2022 is the year of uh, of targeted um, sequencing for TB. <clears throat> we have now fully um, sort of end-to-end -end workflows uh, that will be going for WHO review. I'm naming some of the um, manufacturers here on the, uh, on the assay side and on the sequencing side. <clears throat> I'm giving an image here of a um, one of the smallest sequences of the, nano, the nanopore sequencer from, uh, from Oxford Nanopore here, uh, just to give you an example of how simple uh, it, it can be or how uh, 
how small these instruments are becoming now. And I'll finish off by just mentioning that we have more than yeah, uh, switching gears and now mentioning that we also have now 15 products entering the, uh, the market for, for TB infection testing. Some of these are for, for high throughput. Some of these are very similar to the quantiferent test. Some of these are rapid diagnostic test kind of uh, layouts where you, of course, still have to incubate the sample, but then you can, with a really uh, fast rapid diagnostic test, um, diagnose TB infection. And then uh, in 2022, we also anticipate several new specific skin tests uh, that uses the same antigens as, as the ICRAS uh, to deliver um, um, ICRA-like performance in a, in a skin test uh, format. So my take-home messages uh, after this rundown of, of quite a lot of technologies has been, uh, or is that, that we have a growing pipeline of, of connected new diagnostics and new sampling strategies. And I think we will have come into a future where we can see a diversification uh, and the end to the one size fits all approach we've had in TB. We'll be moving away from sputum, we'll be moving towards point of care, and we will have a lot of digital diagnostics and connectivity enabled diagnostics. However, there is, as I started by saying, there are major gaps that remain and needs to be tackled. Uh, we have tools already now that are not being used and we can reimagine triage and screening approaches with these tools. And we urgently, of course, need new tools to protect the many new TB drugs that are coming out. So molecular uh, and drug susceptibility testing should be key themes to pursue. I'll finish off just by thanking the, the donors and uh, the fine team in Geneva, but also the fine team uh, in our country offices who are supporting a lot of this work. Thank you very much.